Friends, again, it's such a blessing that you are here. Today. Thank you for being in worship today as we start this brand new series. We're going to be rooted in the book of James for the next few weeks. So if you brought your Bible, wonderful. It's near the very end of the Bible. If not, don't worry. The words are right here on the screens as we follow along. We're going to listen to James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And I invite you to hear these words. One more reminder, as I remember, uh, I didn't do this at 930 either, but I want, to remember, I want us to remember that today is also World Communion Sunday. World Communion Sunday, for those of you who don't know, is a Sunday in which we acknowledge that we are partaking in communion across the world with all different brothers and sisters who are partaking in this holy and blessed meal. So we're mindful that the church is not just 12955 Memorial Drive, but that it exists across the world. So keeping that in mind here today and as we dive into this difficult yet beautiful passage from James chapter 2. Hear these words, my friends. From the Holy Scriptures. My brothers and sisters, believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and says, here, Right here, this is a good seat for you. But you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit at my feet on the floor. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into the court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not commit murder. If you do not commit, adult, if, if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, these words this morning are not easy. But I ask that they might inspire something within us to explore our souls to open up our hearts to hear something new and fresh today. God, may every time we open your holy words, they might illumine something more about you to teach us more about ourselves. That's our prayer today. And we pray it in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. I may have shared this before with some of you in the room, but while I was in seminary up in Chicago, I worked as a barista at Pete's Coffee and Tea in Evanston, Illinois. Now, some of my fondest and coldest memories were walking that half mile from my front door all the way to the front of the shop at 5 a.m. to open up the store. When we get in, we only have 30 minutes to get the doors open to get things started. Because, you see, the only people that woke up earlier than us were the butchers at Whole Foods, and they carried sharp knives. So we wanted to make sure they got their coffee in plenty of time uh, before they got unsettled. And so we do everything we could to hustle to get ready for the day. But one part that uh, took the most time to prepare and set was the water pressure on the espresso machine. Now, I knew these espresso machines were top-notch. They're powerful instruments. But I didn't know, until I started working there, how much hinged on the gauge being calibrated each morning. 
And it needed to be calibrated the right way because it would change the way a drink would taste the rest of the day until we closed at 10 p.m. at night. If the pressure was off, that would dramatically affect the flow of water moving through the espresso, making the drink taste off. Believe me, I was the morning taste tester of the espresso. And when it was off, it did not taste good. Oh, I was wide awake all right, just being caffeinated by mud instead of espresso. But we used this machine while we were at Pete's. It was called the Ascaso Arc Espresso Machine, A-R-C, the Arc Espresso Machine. And what you would do is you'd tighten up these dials behind the machine, and you'd know the gauge was set properly whenever there was a special green, very satisfying at 5.15 in the morning, light that would come on in the morning. When those lights were on, you knew your espresso machine was ready to go and that the espresso would taste even better. You see, checking the gauge was critical, regardless of how stressful or busy the morning was, to ensure the very best drink possible. Now, in the same way, why am I talking about coffee? <laughs> Espresso machines this morning, kick off my sermon. Because I think in the same way, James is wanting us to check our gauge. He's saying that if you really want to know how you and God are doing, look at how you treat other people. If that's off, the whole thing could be off. James is saying how you treat other people is a good indication in where you are with God. Not how many Bible verses you have memorized. Not how many Sundays consecutively in a row you've been to church. Not even how much money you put in the offering plate in just a few minutes. But how do you treat other people? How do you treat other people when you know that all other people are made in the image of God? It makes me think of this passage from 1 John that burns me every time I read it, so I'll let it burn you a little bit this morning. He writes, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Ugh. How do you treat other people that are different than you? It's a big question today. I know it's not easy. We live in a world filled with divisiveness and division, and that seems to be highlighted all the time, which makes our passage even more interesting because it seems to be an issue that people called Christians have been dealing with for a very long time. Even so much that James had to write about it. I mean, can you picture that ancient gathering? Go there with me. The letter being read to all the people in the room. The tension that filled those people in that place. I can feel the peripheral vision of people begin to look around to their right and left saying, who's sitting with who? Who's next to where? What's going on over there? I can even hear in the back room someone trying to whisper this word, but instead it comes out a little loud after they hear the reading, just someone go, awkward. This is one of those services that you wish you had stayed home at. Live streaming would have worked a lot better back then if they could have just stayed home and not felt the tension. See, the tragedy with a text like this, y'all, is that if James were writing it to the church today, I'm not sure it'd have to change much for us. I mean, I've read this text several times this week, just like each time a little more difficult than the next. And I'm wondering if I could just switch out the adjectives, describing words, anything to do, and put MDUMC in the words. I mean, look around this room. You don't have to look right now, but think about this room. There's richer and poorer people in this room. We, we, we know that, but also... Compared to the rest of the world, West Houston is a very wealthy place. And so where would the shift come? Better yet, my question is, what would others outside the walls of this space say about us? Right? Are we the rich church on Memorial Drive? Are we the church with that other church next to TJ Maxx on Memorial Drive? Are we the inclusive church on Memorial Drive? 
or the exclusive church on Memorial Drive. I've heard it say a lot. I, I try to wear as much MDMC paraphernalia as I can go and wear when I'm out and about. Someone saw my shirt one time and said, oh, you're the pumpkin patch church. Yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 you. I know where you're at. Someone else said to me, said to me oh, you're the church. Didn't you have all those supplies during Hurricane Harvey? At the, at the refuge, was it? All those, was that you? It was. Or you know what? I went to the day school back then. Is it still open, the day school? Yeah. Still open, bigger than ever. Or I went to the funeral of so-and-so there. I had a wedding that I was a part of there. I, I know that church. I know it's good. What do you hope to be known for? Check your gauge. And James is like, let's talk about it. Let's get right into it. And he comes right out of the gate and he says, my brothers and sisters, and here's the key. He says, believers in Christ must not show favoritism. Maybe some of your translations at home say partiality. I think both words are good, favoritism, partiality. The Greek word for partiality literally means to lift the face. To lift the face. What it's saying is that when you lift the face, you lift it towards one other person or one other group, and by doing so, you're lifting it away from others. In one swoop, you're discriminating against one group and looking away, dishonoring somebody else. Which makes me think of that word discriminating, right? Believers in Christ do not discriminate, the Scriptures say. Now, I know that's a heavy word. We talk about that a lot in the media. We hear a lot in the news, this group discriminated against this group, this person did this. But I think this definition is key. I found a good definition for the word discriminate. It says to discriminate means that we look at a person's outside to determine the worth on their inside. Let me say that again for the people in the back. To discriminate means that we look at a person's outside to determine their inside. James is saying that This way of thinking does not work as a believer in Christ. He's saying to assume something about another person is not the way to be a Christ follower. And and that goes so much against the grain of people like us today, of how we feel like we're trained in the world. And I know it does because I see it in me. I mean, we, we see someone is wearing something and... We're like, oh, I, that, that guy's got a lot of money. Must be. Or we see a sweatshirt someone's wearing with a school name on it. We're like, that cost a lot to go there. Right? Or we recognize what, person, what street the person lives on in the neighborhood around here. Or what club they belong to. We see a person's car. And we begin to do the internal math inside of our heads. And that's a good reminder because a lot of us, partiality, favoritism, assumptions we often muster inside our head and don't keep it out. Micro moments that build up in us something very catastrophic if we don't stop to think about them. I shared this story at the journey uh, before, but about a year ago, my, my car was involved in a wreck and I uh, had to go to the shop. I was told to be in the shop for a few weeks and it turned out to be a month, month or so. Uh, So I had to go through Enterprise to go and find uh, my car. And I I kid you not, when I went to this Enterprise space, the only car available at the rental shop was this Jaguar SUV. (laughs) So, suffering for Jesus, I said yes to the Jaguar SUV, even though I'm more of a Porsche guy anyway. I'm just kidding. That's not even me. Now, let me tell you, it was a nice ride. Okay, friends? It was like brand new. I was right. It was, it was awesome. Uh, and I was a little self-conscious about it, though, too, because I'm a pastor driving a Jaguar. I don't know how that really looks. I was doing okay until I got to my favorite breakfast taco place, a Moderno on Briar Forest at the Beltway. And I parked in front, and I walked inside to go get my tacos I had ordered, and the waitress stopped me and said, Okay, fancy. Look at you. And I was like, Oh, no. Now listen, I know that's tiny in the scheme of things, but that car told a story about something of who I am that I not really, I'm not really am. When we look at a person's outside to determine their worth on the inside. 
Because here's what I know, friends. I've been a pastor here at the church almost, almost 10 years. I've done a few funerals in my life as a pastor here. And I have never seen Jaguar keys inside of a casket. I have never heard a funeral eulogy that talked about how many Gucci sandals or heels or rings the person wore on their fingers. You know what happens at funerals? People speak about the person's heart, about their soul, about their spirit. James is saying to us today in his scripture that, that, that we got to address our heart. Verse 4 gets me every time. He says, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Think about this story I was told one time about a man who went to go see a doctor. And he said, doc, I, I just, I'm not feeling right. The doctor ran a few tests and said, sir, we're going to have to go in and do a triple bypass surgery on you. And his his wife and kids who were in the room with him was like, we're not surprised, Dad. You know, you've, you're, you smoke every single day. You don't really work out very much. You eat horribly. So the doc looked at the, the dad, and the dad said, whoa, 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 hold on one minute. Doc, listen, we don't have to do this surgery. I'll just start eating better. I'll stop smoking. I'll walk around the block with my new pair of shoes that I got like a year ago. And I'll start walking around the block and feeling better. And the doctor kindly stopped him and said, look, fixing your behavior is a good thing to do. You must do that. But before that, we have to go inside and fix your heart and those three clogged arteries that might take you before you lace up those new shoes. Are you catching the connection, brothers and sisters? If we want to deal with discrimination or the act of making assumptions about another person, we have to first deal with our heart. We have to need someone to come inside and work on things that we cannot do on our own. In essence, we need somebody to come and work from the inside out. I think about the civil rights movement. Men like Martin Luther King Jr., who by faith paved the way for our brothers and sisters of color to have equal rights. Because of the civil rights movement, my best friend Marcus can drink from the same water fountain I drink from and vote at the same booth and have the same education that I'm allotted. But you see, the problem with the civil rights movement is that the government can change laws, but it can't change hearts. You can't legislate discrimination away. You can't legislate assumptions from people. That's not what the government promises to do. But friends, I know someone who does know how to do that. His name is Jesus the great healer, the miracle worker. And by grace, Jesus wants to replace all those areas clogged up in your heart. And we all have them, including me. Jesus, through James, is calling the church to address our hearts so that we can then adjust our behaviors. I think about John Wesley, the founder of the, the Methodist movement that we're all a part of. In one of his sermons, he talks about salvation and he, a lot of his contemporaries at the time, they all focused on salvation being like, get out of town, like depart from this earth to go up to the heavenly realm. But Wesley was known as the people's theologian. You see, he, he understood salvation that could happen right here, right now. We could experience it in this moment. In one of his sermons, he writes this. I love this quote. He says, by salvation, I mean not barely according to the vulgar notion of deliverance from hell or going to heaven, but a present deliverance from sin, a restoration of the soul to its primitive health, its original purity, a recovery of the divine nature, the renewal of our souls after the image of God. Friends, what if God's health care was for us to ask for the restoration of our hearts so that we could see the image of God in everyone? And how? James says clearly, if you keep the royal law, found in Scripture, which is to love our neighbors, you are doing all right. But if you show favoritism, you sin. 
Friends, loving others is the gauge that helps our heart once it is fixed. And some of you today might be thinking to yourselves, Pastor, I don't need my heart fixed. (laughs) I'm good. I can take care of it on my own. And I would look at you and say, that's awesome. But even the healthiest people in the world need to see the doctor sometimes. But if you're reading James like me, I know I need surgery. I need the grace of God through Christ to repair me in all the times I've shown partiality or favoritism or discriminate against someone based on an assumption I had. And if that's you, then don't be afraid to go to God. God will hear you. God will hold you. And God will work a wonder in your life. After all this reflecting on this passage today, I thought, I'd use a little acronym to help us because this is a big chunk to take in, friends. We don't do this just tomorrow. I want you to start tomorrow. But we don't do this just all of a sudden. And so I create a little uh, acronym using that in honor of that, all those cold walks to the coffee shop and using that ARC espresso machine. So I use the letters A-R-C, ARC, for us to remember how we must check our gauge in our lives. The first is A. A is for awareness. Are you aware of the behaviors that sometimes flow from you? Are you keeping check with God's help on how your espresso tastes? (laughs) Is it a little muddy? It can be sometimes, friends. What do you need to do to realign yourself to that royal law, which is to love your neighbor as yourself? So we've got A, awareness. R is for relationships. Are the people that you associate with helping you to gauge what's being right and what's wrong. Also, do all the people that you're connected with look exactly like you? I heard a pastor once say to me, proximity breeds empathy and distance breeds suspicion. Can I encourage you this morning to give it a try? To befriend someone who is different than you and learn from their perspective first. And if you're like, how in the world do I learn, Pastor Jarbo? Try listening first. And finally, C is for commitment. After heart surgery, it would be crazy if the doctor said, go run a marathon tomorrow. You got it. I believe in you. Your heart's fine. That'd be wild. The same goes for God. If we commit to one area of our lives of loving our neighbor more, of stop the, stopping the judgment to restore our heart to its primitive health, as Wesley says, which is pure and made in the image of God, we're going to begin to see a difference. If we commit ourselves to that, our behaviors will reflect our new heart. And it won't happen by simply doing nothing. It takes engaging and committing to reflecting Christ in all that we do. I'll close with this. I admit, today's sermon in the sanctuary was not the easiest to preach to you all. And if I could have picked another scripture to read for my first time back in months, James 2 might not have been the one I would have chosen. But I tend to find those hard scriptures to hear are the ones we need to hear the most. And I preach it because I strive alongside you that we can actually become it. We can live it in our lives. We can. I believe we can. Because thankfully, we don't do this thing alone. When we ask the question of our sermon series, what about us? I hope our response is, I'm going to (laughs) try. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to see the good doctor. I'm going to check my gauge. And you know what's going to happen the more times we ask that? When people look at this church and they ask about it, people are like, what is that church known for? Someone who drives by, they're going to drive by and say, oh, Memorial, Tri- Memorial Drive, the United Methodist Church, right over there down the street. Oh, them. That's the church that loves Jesus. That's the church that, that loves their neighbors. That's the church that leaves assumptions at the door. May it be so. Amen.